So in this video, the first part of our four-part lecture series for our online qualitative research methodology residential school, we will be looking at research interviews. What are they and how do they fit into the research process and what different forms do they take? things about these videos. I'm not going to be able to do all my fancy visual tricks. I'll try and make these look not too bland, but I'm kind of having to rush these out a little bit. So um, they might be kind of bare bones stuff, but I'll take enough care with them uh, to try and make them look less than complete amateurish if I can. I'll do what I can, but I want to try and get these videos out to you fairly quickly so you have plenty of time preparing for the residential. So. Our residential school focuses on data collection through one-to-one -one online interviewing. And I have a question to start with. Who is your favorite interviewer? Right, we're gonna get back to that. <laughs> gonna get back to that in a minute. But think about who your favorite interviewer is. Now, some of you might use interviews as part of your job, not necessarily as part of research, but, um, say in clinical or social work support settings, things like that, you know, when you're interviewing someone, um, you need to find out information from them. Some of you, uh, because of COVID-19, may be working from home and finding yourself conducting a form of online interviewing as part of your job. You know, it might not be described as research again, it might not be described as a research project, but it's nonetheless all about asking questions and obtaining data also known as knowledge and understanding. Now you might have undertaken research interviews as part of your job, but also as part of your previous studies. So you may have some had, had some exposure to this method, this method of research interviewing, particularly one-to-one -one research interviews. Sorry, I'm sweating. I know I go on about this, but I've had to turn the air conditioning off because it's, it's too noisy, but then I sweat. The things I do for you guys. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so you might have had some exposure to this method. Now, I think that in these videos, you might be surprised by, by how we're going to approach research interviews. And you might there might be a few surprises in the content of our residential school when you um, go online on our residential school. Now, we're actually going to look at interviewing styles from radio and television. We're gonna mix the knowledge we have about that into our understanding of research interviews. Specifically, we're gonna look at documentary making. As journalism, as a profession, has a, has a lot we can learn from. We can learn a lot from journalists, the good ones. Right, now, let's go back to that question of who's your favorite interviewer. Now, some of you might have had no problem with this. Sorry, my phone's going off. That's all happening. So some of you might have um, yeah, <laughs> had no problem thinking of your favorite interviewer. Some of you might have been a bit confused. Um, those of you who might have got a little bit confused might have been those who asked yourself the equivalent of who's my favorite researcher? Who's my favorite researcher? Is there such a thing as someone having a favorite researcher? No wonder you got confused. Uh, but if you think about TV presenters, then perhaps you didn't struggle at all. The question is fairly easy, you know? Who's your favorite interviewer? So here we're talking about um, interviews on TV. So this is just a point to, to how sometimes we forget that it's not just a research method. You know, interviewing is not just a research method. It's a tool used in a variety of settings and for a variety of purposes. Now, if you're able to think of a favorite interviewer, what is it about them that you like? If you're still struggling, think of people like, and this will Louis Theroux, that'll make sense to you beyond outside of Australia, if you're watching this outside of Australia. But I'm speaking to my class who are all based in Australia. But you know Louis Theroux, but a few more, um, or Graham Norton, UK. I'm getting biased here. I'm talking about my UK favorite interviews. Okay, Australian ones that people outside of Australia might not be that familiar with. Eddie Maguire, about Z Julie Zamiro, people like that. Now, if you're still clueless, that's okay, let's move on. You know, maybe you don't watch that much television. But 
If your favourite interviewer is Louis Theroux, you're in for a bit of a treat in day one of our residential school. Now, where does interviewing fit in the research process? Well, once you have identified your research topic and then developed your research question, you then need to ask that question and collect data. And that is where the research interview comes in. And once you've decided that you're going to ask participants some interview questions, you then, of course, have to work out what interview questions to ask. And that's much of what our residential is going to be about. So here is what we will get from the two days of our residential. You'll be able to define interviews, the different types of interviews, and know the type of research questions for which interviews are useful. And you'll know the strengths and limitations of interviews. Uh, you'll know and use the list of qualities of good interview questions to develop your own questions. That happens in day two of our residential. Uh, number four, you will develop a trial. You will develop, trial, and review an interview guide for your research question. Again, that all happens on day two. And number five, you will know how to prepare for a face-to-face -face interview in terms of timing, location, and recording. Number six, you will be given someone to interview and you'll schedule yourself an individual online research interview with that person, which will take place sometime in teaching week six or seven, which is um, the week um, after the midterm break. So after our online residential, then there's a midterm break. And then the week after that is week six. So it's going to either happen in week six or seven. Those are the uh, two weeks where we're going to schedule those individual interviews. So it's about three weeks away from the residential. So let's talk um, about interviews. Let's define what an interview is. Let's look at the different types of interview, interview. And then I'm going to tell you what an interview guide is. So interviewing is a really common tool for gathering information and it's the most commonly used method for collecting data in qualitative research. Now I found this definition in the textbook quite useful. An interview is a professional conversation. It's a conversation in that it's friendly and open and we're interested in the other person. But it's a conversation where both parties don't take equal turns. In a research interview, most of the talking is done by the participant um, and we're interested in their experiences and in capturing these experiences in their language and from their perspectives. As an interviewer, your role in the conversation is primarily listening and helping the person tell their story in rich detail. And at the same time, you're also ensuring that you're gathering information about the topic you're interested in. I mean, otherwise it's not research, you know? So this is actually um, quite a complicated thing to do. It doesn't sound that complicated, but it's actually quite a complicated thing to do. So although interviews are really common, good interviewing is actually quite rare. It's really challenging. And um, interviews can go quite badly as well as go quite amazingly well. So I'm going to try and get you to do your interviews so they go amazingly well, obviously. <laughs> I don't want oh, you to do bad interviews. I'll try. I'll, I'll do what I can. But after our residential, um, I think you'll be able to do this pretty well. Now, broadly speaking, there are three types of interviews. The structured interview is more like a survey in an interview form. You know, it's rarely used in qualitative research. This is because it's hard to establish rapport with this type of interviewing technique. Whenever you see someone using one of these structured interviews, you should be a bit skeptical as to whether they really are undertaking qualitative research or are really tuned into qualitative research because it's too structured, it's too formal, it's too systematic and qualitative interviewing and qualitative methods generally often much more flexible. So let's come to the second type, which is semi-structured interviews. These are the most commonly used type in qualitative research. Here, you have an interview guide before the interview, but you don't rigidly adhere to it. There's no precise wording of the question or order in which questions should be asked, which means that your interview can be sensitive to the context in which you're interviewing. You can adapt your language to be more informal or to accommodate an interviewee's previous responses. And you can shift your question order around to follow what the participant brings up 
in the order in which they talk about different issues. And this is where the idea of the conversation becomes useful. In a conversation with a new friend who, in response to your question about whether or not they had a pet, said yes, they had a dog, you wouldn't then follow this question up uh, with, oh, so what do you call your cat or dog or other animal? You know, you, 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 don't, you don't do that in an interview either. You know, you follow their lead and shape your questions to suit their response. So you say, you know, what's your dog called? So semi-structured, you start with an interview guide, but generally you don't look at it that much because you really want to loosen up and avoid reading from a script. Now, unstructured is a little looser again. The example on page, 80, page 82 of the textbook um, it gives an interview guide for women's experience of polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a good example of a what's called an un, sometimes called an unstructured interview. But though most, most people call it unstructured, it isn't actually unstructured. It's not that it lacks structure. It, what it is is it's not structured beforehand by the researcher. There is a structure to these interviews, but it's one that emerges during the interview, and it's usually emergent from the conversation that you have with the participant. So maybe it's better to call it an emergent structure. You could also think of it as a structure that's negotiated between the researcher and the interviewee. You know, not an overt negotiation. <laughs> you know, not getting the UN involved or anything like that. You know, you, you don't go through a list of questions and negotiate which ones to include or not. You know, it's not that formal. Rather, it's an inherent negotiation. You know, this structure has a quality of having been negotiated through, um, but mostly in favour of the interviewee. So it's structured around the, the particular interests of the interviewee as they relate to the research question. Now here, you don't as an interviewer go in with questions, but you can go in with topic areas, you know, that you'd hope the conversation could cover. That type of interviewing is really scary when you're starting off. So I wouldn't advise that when you're starting off. But as you get more experience, it can be really good, a really good way of interviewing because you get a lot of freedom. Really interesting stuff happen, often happen in those interviews. Now we'll be using the semi-structured interviews. It, it's because it's the most common and is with a little practice pretty easy to use particularly by people who are new to interviewing now i've used a couple of definitions here notice how they try to balance these two aspects of a semi-structured interview you know these interviews are directive in that we have a particular purpose in conducting them but how we conduct them should encourage the conversation to flow another way of thinking about this is being on topic but hanging a bit loose so we use an interview guide and I'll talk more about what that is in a moment, but the, the wording and order of questions varies from that on, the pap on our paper, on what we've written down. You know, we don't actually ask those exact questions in that exact um, structure, in that list, in that sequence. That's the word I was after. The other thing is that the questions are mostly open-ended, so people's responses can be quite varied. We'll get on to open-ended questions in a little while. Um, Semi-structured interviews also give you, the interviewer, room to follow up on unanticipated answers and pursue areas you'd not originally identified as of interest, as long as those areas are relevant to your research question. So, interviews are really useful for gathering data for experience questions, understanding and perception questions, and practice questions. What are those? Well, if you go back to the videos for Teaching Week 3, which is where I tell you all about these different forms of questions, have a look at that, remind yourself. But I've given some examples on this slide in relation to preparing for a cyclone. Say that was your research topic. So have a read through these, you know, just pause the video and have a read through the slide. <laughs> okay. Back with me? Cool. For the understanding and uh, perception questions, interviews are best if it's an issue that's important to the participant. They're a bit trickier to ask as they can be more abstract than based on experience or practice type questions, you know, so it can be a little difficult for people to answer. So this is the type of research question where I would be more likely to conduct focus groups to collect my data. When we're interested in new or unfamiliar or abstract issues, a focus group uh, would be more likely a better method because it's more likely to elicit a conversation, get the conversation going quicker. And that's because in a one-to-one -one interview, 
when the question is quite abstract and difficult to answer, you can have a long, awkward silence and it can all be uncomfortable. But if you're in a group, it's not so uncomfortable because you can just blame each other for not speaking and then eventually someone will speak. You know, someone will can't bear the silence anymore and they'll speak and save the rest of us. Okay, and to finish off this video, let's go through some of the main strengths and limitations of qualitative interviews. So, the positives. A big positive is that you can obtain rich and detailed data, and you also have a lot of flexibility with interviews, particularly when you use semi-structured or emergent structured interviews. So you, can all, you also don't need large sample sizes. You can obtain sufficient data with relatively small samples, and this makes the research more practical in many settings where it's hard to obtain very large samples. And when you have a skilled interviewer, it can be an excellent method for researching sensitive issues where you might otherwise find participants responding in a shallow and socially desirable answer, in a socially desirable way. So, you know, if you have a question that asks, are you a racist? Most people will say, I'm, no, I'm not a racist. Uh, because if they said, yes, I'm a racist, they think that, you know, you'll see them and everyone else will see them as a bad person they, and misunderstand them. You know, I'm not bad, but I'm just a little bit racist. Now, with a qualitative interview, it gives people the opportunity to explain themselves. You know, they can say, no, I'm not a racist, but... And then you get to access in more depth what someone is actually thinking. It's also a good method for reaching different social groups because you can more easily adapt the interview so that it's culturally sensitive. So the social norms of the people you're interviewing can inform the way you ask your questions. But you need cultural awareness for that and we'll talk about that more when we get onto the topic of indigenous issues later in our unit. Now finally, you have a lot of control over your data in qualitative research interviews. If you find that a question is delivering blank answers, you can change your question to find other ways into the topic that you, and, and find questions that are more likely to elicit fuller insights. Now, onto the limitations. Yes, there are limitations, and <laughs> there, there are a few of them. Interviews are very time consuming. An interview might take an hour, but you then have a lot of data. Typically, People speak at around 130 words a minute. I'm speaking a little quicker because I want to get through the video for you quickly so it doesn't take a lot of your time up. And now I've just rattled on about that. I've taken more of your time up. Sorry, get back to the point. Um, if you have got an hour interview, uh, you, you could have up to 8,000 words to transcribe. Now, average person types at around 40 words per minute. So those 8,000 words could take you three hours of solid typing. But actually, it takes much longer than that. The industry standard or rate you would pay a transcriber would typically be about four hours per hour. So you pay, it would take a transcriber four hours to transcribe one hour of interview. But if you're transcribing an interview yourself and you're not a trained transcriber, well, you should double that. Um, so it can take you up to about eight hours for just one interview. Uh, but it's becoming less of a problem. Uh, now we have digital recordings. We're also getting voice recognition software. It's not quite there yet, but it's getting better. So not talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about, about how you can code from a digital recording quite easily because you can jump between sections of the recording very quickly, which you couldn't do when we used magnetic tapes for audio recordings. But it's quite interesting that Researchers haven't really moved on from those days. You know, we, we started moving away from those days, what, in the 1990s? Um, certainly by year 2000, well on the way to digital recordings by then, I think. Uh, but there's a bit of a lag with researchers. We're not quite caught up to that stuff yet. So we still insist in transcribing. People are still used to using transcription, like doing their analysis from a typed transcript, because that's the way we, all, we all always used to do it. But slowly things are changing and more and more people, I think, will be using, uh, doing the analysis direct from the recording because it's easy to move around the recording, you know, just using time codes really to identify different sections of text. Anyway, I'm going off on one here. But, you know, just be warned, a lot of people still insist on us transcribing our interviews. Now, that aside, even if you don't transcribe your interview, you have hours and hours of analysis ahead. You have to read and reread or listen and re-listen to the interview and the transcript and start making notes, read it again. It takes forever. Trust me, it takes forever. So it's very time consuming doing the analysis. 
And another limitation is that in unskilled hands, it's not a good method. If you're not a skilled interviewer, you may get really shallow data and people may not share their thoughts with you on more sensitive topics. It's also a method that makes it hard to maintain participants' anonymity. It's easy online, but still, interviews are all about people giving you rich details of their experiences, their thoughts, feelings, and often about their lives. You know, they can be identified by that. That can put some people off participating in interviews because they're a little bit too personal and not that private at the end of the day. And finally, participants can have less control over the data as they can end up disclosing things they might not ordinarily disclose because you've established trust and rapport with them. So you have to be careful with that. You know, make sure that people aren't disclosing things that actually maybe they will regret. Okay. That's enough for this video. In part two, I'll tell you how to design an interview guide, something you need to do for assessment one. Till then, ta-da. Perfect.